trial based on insinuation and innuendo. Nothing substantive offered against Mr. Trump, much less proven. I implore you, do not continue with this proceeding. End it now. Would it surprise you to learn that you have violated the Prime Directive a total of nine times since you took command of the Enterprise? I beg your pardon? Lieutenant. Brett, a lot to digest for our little minds here. The, uh, you know, obviously we, we move to the making of memes and content. We got up, like, these people are straight out of central casting. If I were to look for a attorney to defend uh, the tyrant uh, and the sort of like deeply feline energy of the Biden regime when it comes to like going after Donald Trump and using lawfare to destroy your political enemy, can't get better. That it can't get better than this than this solicitor here. Uh, however, maybe you can clear up two things for us. One, uh, did this go well for Donald Trump? Two, uh, have you argued before the Supreme Court? I don't actually know. Thanks, thanks, Benny, for having me on. I'm a member of the Supreme Court. I have not argued uh, oral arguments. Several cases I've brought and written briefs. Uh, we never got to oral arguments. So, hopefully, I'll have my my chance and my opportunity. I have argued multiple cases on the uh, appellate side in several different circuits across the across the country but you know look i it, it is interesting um you know i the last exchange was was particularly painful listening to you know the solicitor and um and uh, justice jackson you know going back and forth was particularly painful for me because it was not uh it was not elegant and it was not in, intellectually sound it was it was the all the makings of you know platitudes and reasons that you might want to rule a certain way based on you, you know the appearance of the case politically but it was not actually digging into the weaknesses um that many of the other justices did dig into and i mean what what came out of the dc circuit was literally mocked by by justice roberts and um you know he's he's no hardcore conservative as we know so for him to have taken that opinion and looked at it and said, you know, perhaps one of the more poorly written opinions <laughs> that he's reviewed is is remarkable. What I saw sort of at the at the cusp here, and of course we're no legal experts, but we're taking this, you know, I think in the the best that you can possibly uh, approach something like this, and these are really big issues at hand, is uh, from the broader takeaways, which is what is going to stop every president from having to pardon himself every morning that he wakes up, right? And, and to pardon himself moving forward, assuming assuming that the second that power flips even to like a different wing of his own party, his or her own party, is gonna, you're gonna automatically be prosecuted, right? Like, so every, every step uh, that you take is a prosecutable offense. They went back to the Gerald Ford pardoning of Richard Nixon. Why not prosecute Gerald Ford? Is an obstruction of justice. What about Lyndon Baines Johnson, who over Kavanaugh went in on this overtly like lied again and again and again to the public about the Vietnam War, got people killed. Speaking of being killed, they asked about the Kavanaugh asked about the Obama drone attack on mm -hmm. Anwar al Awlaki, 16 year old, a 16 year old Amer a, a, a United States citizen without due process. I mean, it just seems like the limiting principle here is you'll never have anyone want to run for president again because they know for a fact they'll they'll they better they're going to be prosecuted unless they pardon themselves every single day of their existence as president. Yeah, I, I think you hit many on some very key moments. I mean, there were moments in this where we got a vision of the overarching concern. How many justices did you hear? Multiple justices actually said, you know, not really focused on this case, but really focused on what could happen if we get this wrong going down, you know, down the line these cases that are gonna to come to us. And I thought it very fascinating that Alito brought up this. He said, he said to Dreeben, um, tell me how substantial a, a protection this is. And he cited two things. He said, how substantial is the protection that the um, Justice Department officials will act with integrity and honor, honor and not abuse their, their power? 
And Dreben's response was, oh, it is, it's, a, it's a, an incredible protection, incredible protection. And yet he's saying that while all of us are watching just outrageous decisions by DOJ to target people and to exercise their, their power in incredibly abusive ways that we haven't seen for 30 years in this country. Yeah. And, and so I, I, I think about that, that he's actually stating that this is an, an enormous protection. And then the second one was he said, how much of a protection is the grand jury? And Dreven came back. It is such a big protection. And think about this. This is how big it is. It's, it's, it's citizens making sure. And if they thought that prosecutors weren't bringing, you know, appropriate, didn't have the facts or the law, they would not return an indictment. And let me just respond to Dreven on that. In, in 25 years in the criminal justice system, the number of no bills, that's, that's when the grand jury comes back and says no indictment, is less than 1%. Wow. And, and, and of For those, your cases or for all cases, Brett? All cases across DOJ, less wow. than 1%. And then of my cases, I want you to give, I want to give you this personal experience. <laughs> I was a brand new prosecutor. I had, I had presented and got indictments on over a thousand cases. The first few years I was uh, an, an assistant U.S. attorney. And I had one case in which a grand jury no billed me on one count of a 16 count indictment. And I was mocked in the office like horribly for months because I was the one AUSA that anybody <laughs> knew of that got a no bill on a, a one count. <laughs> it was painful. So the culture itself defies what Dreven was saying. The results and the data itself absolutely defies what Dreven was saying. And in fact, Dreven, in my opinion, had an obligation at that moment to say, it is no real check. On, on potential abuse. The grand yes. jury is no real check, but they consist consistently, they believe the lie that the grand jury and that the honor of the prosecutor will, will protect anyone from, you know, being improperly prosecuted. Both of those are a lie. Both of those are lying. And Jack Smith was able to get a conviction against another Republican, a rising Republican star, a guy named Bob McDonald. He was the governor of Virginia. And he was able to get a big conviction, destroy the guy's career, and the Supreme Court over, overturned it 9-0. Yeah, Supreme Court would never, 9-0, yeah. 9-0, he's the same guy. That's right. And, and, and remember, we have historical increases, in my opinion, of the number of cases that are brought where, the, where this is the mentality. Benny, the mentality used to be, I do not want to bring a case that I don't think I have sufficient facts. And, and Ed Meese, when he was attorney general uh, for Reagan, used to congratulate, call and congratulate a prosecutor when he learned that he declined to bring a case because mm. he felt like that was as, as important as the decision to, to actually bring one. We've changed now and the mentality among prosecutors and DOJ is, is rife with this mentality. And that is, I'll just charge it. Even if I don't think I have it, we'll let the jury decide. We'll mm -hmm. let the we'll we'll see what happens. I'll just charge the case, and that's more often than not the justification they use for going forward on a case like Jack Smith did, uh, and 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 others. I mean, I mean, you remember uh, the prosecution of uh, Stevens uh, from Alaska. I mean, it ruined people's mm -hmm. lives, and, and in the end, we learned there were you know mis misconduct by prosecutors. And, and that is the DOJ that we're fighting to fighting back against to try to return them to actually an effective, you know, a branch of the government that's not abusing its power. Could you please, uh, from again, a 35,000 foot perspective, explaining it to us like we're second graders, uh, give me the strongest arguments in favor of upholding Donald Trump's immunity that you heard today. Well, it, it there was a lot of discussion about absolute immunity and everybody sort of agreed that um, there is no, there's no absolute immunity. You can have a president that might be president, you know, at the time he's in office and he goes out and he, he kills somebody and, and, and he does it personally. And there's not an argument that it's within, you know, his, uh, you know, his official duties. 
but <clears throat> that's not what we're talking about. Even though Dreven wanted to suggest that that is what you know Trump's lawyers are asking for, it's not the case. It, everybody concedes that absolute immunity is um, you know the only place that it it actually really applies is from a civil lawsuit while he's in office from somebody trying to sue the president over over things there you get closer to absolute immunity here we're talking about a criminal case and so the analysis falls to the level of immunity and how much do we extend it and how protected is the president under article 2 which gives him the basic power of the executive branch so then the question is where do we parse the line you you there are unofficial acts that still need to be protected that um and so that line is very gray it's blurry and that's what the supreme court is battling right now is where are we drawing the line because if the president is asking for an election is saying claiming that an election is is been fraudulently you know um, um stolen or or that he actually won um and then he's asking people to go and review that they're there's an argument that that's you know personal and that it, he's a candidate at that point and can we go after him for his comments and words about that that may have riled people up that went into the capitol um whereas the supreme court is nervous about that because it is not a clear criminal action that occurs like the homicide and so their concern is do we draw the line so bright and so narrow that we've given way too much protection or if we don't draw the line that is is if we draw it too broad have we have we basically invited every you know administration to go after their political opponents and that's why this case is so monumental is they're going to give us some insight into you know how strong do we do we extend that immunity to those gray areas such an interesting line of questioning uh, since you brought up people walking into the U.S. Capitol, right? So such an interesting line of questioning. I believe it was Alito, uh, but it may have been Gorsuch saying, what if a president leads a protest, peaceful protest? Well, the presidents have done that in the right. past. Right. And, and, and that disrupts things, right? Certainly very disruptive, right? Order the National Guard troops that Kennedy did, you know, to go, uh, to go I I in integrate colleges in the South, right? What if, what if the president leads a peaceful protest? What if that yeah. disrupts an official proceeding? So the president now, 22 years in prison, like I, it's such a great, I thought that was such a fascinating point. And the point that you just brought up is the obvious shades of gray here. And Clarence Thomas asking about presidents carrying out coups. I mean, Clarence Thomas is straight up. She's like, presidents have carried out coups. They, they have murdered other world leaders. <laughs> They yeah. have done regime change. He brought up Operation Mongoose. Clarence Thomas is straight up leaning like these. These are li you're literally slaughtering. Right. But you're ordering the slaughter of people yeah. and the regime change of people you don't like. And that's why so, it all comes back to this. This you notice they they mentioned several times. Um, it's never been done. We don't prosecute presidents. They bring up Nixon, but it is an entirely different standard in Nixon. And many in the court think that Nixon was decided you know, poorly. And that, that there, there are some things that need to be changed in that regard. But you'll notice nobody else is prosecuted. And that was an important point for several because they're saying to themselves, are we going to try to stray from this powerful protection we give to the head of the executive branch? Or are we going to facilitate, you know, a change in the future of our country in which we use the power that we have in order to go after our, our political enemies. And I'll just, I'll just tell you this, Benny, that was sort of hit me very, very profoundly is please when, when the founders of our constitution decided, and there was discussion and debate whether or not a president with a felony, a candidate with a felony could run for president. They, they nearly unanimously decided that they should be allowed mm. and the reason they decided that was because they knew they were giving extraordinary power to the executive branch and they knew that the power to investigate and to to you know prosecute someone to take away their liberty was so powerful 
that it could be wielded ab abusively. And if that was the case, they could foresee that they would go after a political opponent. So, so why would a, a founding fathers, why would they so importantly decide that they were not going to prevent someone from running for president if he had a conviction, a felony conviction, but at the same time, make the protection of the president while he's in office and, and, and his conduct, make it so weak that they could be prosecuted easily after they leave. That makes no sense whatsoever. It, the only consistency would be is if they wanted to protect the president, they wanted to prevent people from using the power of the prosecution to eliminate an enemy. And the way they backstop that is to not allow, to expand immunity enough to not allow them to go after them after they're in office. And that is the only consistent reading of the of the constitutional immunity and the the, the you know the Article Two clause and that extends this power. And I don't care if you if you don't like Donald Trump and you're very upset and angry at him, you should not be wanting to rule uh, along the lines of that Dreven is asking us to do because it is changing that landscape. It is um, denying what the founders foresaw. And that was the use of, of prosecution to go after political enemies. Brett, weren't all the founders felons? By British law? <laughs> right, right. So many of them. And, and so many of them also represented, you know, felons were lawyers that represented them. And they, they understood abuse of power like nobody, nobody else did. In our, you know, in our filtered and in our now you know, woke culture that we're in now, nobody really believes um, on the left that government is really that abusive, right? They they think government is the answer for for solving so many of our social social you know issues, but in fact, this country is founded on recognizing that government is the exact opposite of a solution to a social mm -hmm. problem. Can you, uh, without character, without like characterizing it further, I suppose, because it, there's all these great quotes and there's all sort of this, these very interesting uh, approaches here, obviously from the Trump lawyer and f from Dweeben. But for us, you know, I suppose, given that you have done this for three decades and that you know the consequences of them, the Supreme Court getting it wrong and the current makeup of the Supreme Court, Brett Kavanaugh call, calls this a monumental decision that will echo throughout the ages, he said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, like, do you think this was a good or a bad day for the team that is defending Donald Trump here? Do you think that the Supreme Court will return something that just that 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 destroys Jack Smith prosecutions of President Trump? Yeah, it's a great question, Mike. My, my thought after listening to it, and it's always sort of crystal ball moment, right? Trying to predict it. But I, I do think that it's a good day. On balance, it is a far better day for Trump's defense team than it was for DOJ. And I say that because you also had some expression of concern about what they do by those who are the left-leaning justices. And, and though, though they may in the end side with DOJ, it's far more likely that you'll get a 6-3 decision in which they reverse the DC circuit opinion. They may send it back for them to make additional findings, which will certainly delay. And that's, that's you know, a benefit to, to Trump's defense team. But at best, they also may, may reverse and, and, and may solidify the fact that um, their concern is about going after a former president um, in line with Remember what Alito, or sorry, Gorsuch, I believe it may have been Kavanaugh. No, it was Kavanaugh, I think, said. He said, remember, we, we just recently have a decision in which we said our concern would be to pick the man and then scour the law books to find something we can go after him for. And with that mentality, that's that's a good day for um, for the defense team on balance. And I would I would I would suggest you're probably going to get a six three. It could be five four, but a six three decision reverse in the D.C. Circuit. And then the question will be, do they give them you know, does it does it does, is it enough to tear down the, the Jack Smith prosecution? That's a possibility. I think it's within play. There's many that believe that the more likely is to reverse the DC circuit and give them instruction on, you know, a uh, follow-up that they need to do in order to reach the decision, in which case uh, we might be back in front of the Supreme Court. Hmm. Well, 
it was a, a, a very interesting arguments, honestly, to listen to. Yeah. It was, yeah. it was, uh, you know, I think that Trump's attorney made a great, it did a did a good showing. Um, you notice Benny at the end. You'll, you'll notice at the end that he didn't. Re, he uh, he was given opportunity to for rebuttal. Yeah, and he didn't take it. And the reason why, um, my guess is, is he didn't think that Draven landed any punches. So yeah. We'll yeah. see what happens. I mean, he, he, he began, you know, he began his conversation uh, uh, by saying, wait a second, you know, what m many, many would view what Joe Biden's doing on the border as illegal right now. And actually, based yeah, on American law, yeah. <laughs> based on American <laughs> law that Joe Biden ratified in the Senate in 1964 Immigration Act, it is illegal, and there's no other way to interpret that. And so, what's to stop everyone from prosecuting Joe Biden as soon as he's out of office? Boom! Well, there it is. It, it, in fact, um, and I, I know there are colleagues of mine that disagree with me on this, but I believe that conservative prosecutors they need the facts of course they should not you know cut corners but they need to hit back and hit back hard and there needs to be prosecutions of democrat leaders um you see what happened in arizona you're seeing what's happening across the country and until you know prosecutors go after some of these folks and punch them back they're going to continue to be the bullies that they are yes uh, brett just since you brought it up it's really important obviously something that's uh, really concerning what happened in Arizona last night because that that attorney general not only you know is that attorney general won by 200 votes when there was massive machine admitted machine breakdowns mm -hmm. and a, a nightmare of an election in Arizona but also also she was on MSNBC a week ago saying we got to get Joe Biden elected yes and, and it's a what I mean that timeline seems uh, like remarkably corrupt um and so like one, your take on that, cause that sort of hit yeah. me out of the blue as it dropped last night at 7 PM, uh, and hit our team out of the blue. And then your overall two part question, your overall, uh, strategy when it comes to Donald Trump taking over in 2024, if you were to advise in order to end this, right? Because I don't think anybody wants the tit for tat that's going to leave the whole world blind, right? The eye for the eye. Like, how do you, how do you do this? How do you structure this in a way that it doesn't happen again? How do you, how do you make it hurt? I'm a parent. How do you spank <laughs> in a way that you correct the behavior? Yes. Yes. So, you know, this is, this is my, my opinion on this and I'll, I'll tell you, um, you know, I, I think it will work, but, um, so addressing what happened in Arizona, I think it's outrageous. The timing is outrageous. And, but not only that, they've already found and it has been legitimized by by courts they found that that election fraud occurred in arizona you are going after the lawyers and electors who were acting in their official capacity who believed that they were making correct decisions you can disagree with that but applying the law to prosecute them for for their you know they're exercising their their authority um, based on what they knew at the time, and then going after the lawyers is is you know it's akin to obviously what's happening in Fulton County, Georgia, and the prosecution of the the attorneys. It's a very ugly, ugly uh, chapter, and it needs to be stopped. So you need to have massive funding that's built, a fund that can be dedicated to defend the lawyers. I never thought I'd say that, but you do have to defend these lawyers who are willing to to go into court, make arguments. They're they're allowed to do that. So that's one thing. You have to have a thirty to fifty million dollar defense fund that's put up by folks to go out defend these lawyers. Otherwise, you're seeing what happened in Fulton County, where they're just coming in, they're scared, they they plead guilty, and and it sets bad precedent. And then Arizona gains confidence and says, "We'll go ahead." The second thing that you have to do, obviously, if Trump gets in, you get you get people in positions and they need to be, you know, people that are, are going to be basing their decisions on the law and the facts. But I do think you punch a bully back and, and then maybe we get to a place where both sides say, okay, we'll, we'll call a ceasefire and we'll stop, you know, going at each other, our political adversaries as aggressively. But having said that, if we do not change the immunity laws on prosecutors, which has developed and become so robust that they are absolutely protected 
even when they uh, abuse their positions, even when there's findings of misconduct, a, a, a judge, a state court judge in a criminal case right now and a federal court judge in a criminal case right now, neither one of them have any confidence that they can sanction a prosecutor for misconduct. So it is not clear. The law has not been developed. So the immunity, and Clarence Thomas talks about this, the immunity, um, you know, qualified immunity has grown and expanded to such a degree that we cannot hold bad acting prosecutors accountable. And people say to me, well, there's the bar. You could file a complaint. You could um, you could bring a civil lawsuit. That's totally not true. The, the bars, their ability to hold a prosecutor in check is virtually nothing. Um, because they operate under different laws. And then the, the civil lawsuits cannot go forward against prosecutors. Um, and, and they are thrown out routinely in this country. So until we, we do change that qualified immunity where they have some risk to making a decision like Alvin Bragg or like Fannie Willis to where they have some personal exposure on this, then um, we'll continue to have these problems. Yeah. it. I mean, the Arizona thing, again, it did. Ch- it, it certainly did shock our our team and um you know it makes it really makes really makes you wonder right like you doth protest too much there's a really nice line in shakespeare about this kind of stuff yes right and as you said there has been there's been proven fraud that people have gone to jail people have been federally prosecuted for fraud in arizona uh in these elections Uh, we've we've covered that we know them by name we've we've covered the cases and this is all this is all factual has been done by the doj so to to again to to not just follow the constitution here uh alternate electors slates of electors a bunch of actors tried to do this in 2016 i remember the video michael <laughs> Sheen, right like martin sheen well, like, that's, like, in like, our I'm, history in our history in this country electors have refused to uh they they've put presented different names and they didn't get prosecuted i mean over no. 250 years we've had electors that have gone you know wild and rogue as as people might describe it and they didn't get prosecuted and that's the difference is the democrats have been willing to say it's okay we'll ignore the law we don't care if it applies it's not going to apply to us and we'll apply a standard that's different and we're willing to use our office to do it and and that is the status right now in our country and we need better officials in those positions but we also need more guardrails to rein them in yeah, Democrats literally put together an alternate slate of electors for Florida in the year 2000 and had to be decided at the Supreme Court, <laughs> right? Like, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Okay, got yeah. it. Okay, yeah, geez. Okay, hey, thank you, Brett. Like, right thank on you, crime. Ben. Everybody got to go follow Brett. He's the best. Uh, make sure that you are supporting him and his work. Uh, one of the, you know, one of one of the few people who can charge like a herd of stallions <laughs> through the countryside of the 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 the, the, the dustbin of the DOJ and uh, some of the corruption there. So well thank done. You. Thank you, uh, Brett. Thank you. Thanks, Godspeed. Benny.